We've got pylons coming. And for those of you in the east of England, from Norwich through to Tilsbury, you're going to get 112 miles of pylons. Now, they're thinking of designing them to look like um, reindeer, so they're not so uh, nasty to look at. So that'll be interesting to see. And Rachel Reeves has said that apparently all of these pylons, if we want to get, uh, is the only way to get Putin's boot off our neck because we need to invest in homegrown renewables. But my question is, is sustainable now unsustainable? And I believe it is. Debbie, thank you very much for that. Uh, now, Ben, let's come on to you. And, uh, well, we're going to talk about the Fabian Society. Indeed we are. And hello, everybody. The uh, big question for me is, if we just live through a radical Marxist takeover of the British state, and as Mike said, we're going to talk about the Fabian Society, the British secret society and think tank, proto think tank. It was established in 1884. I don't think the think tank term had appeared by that point. But their express aim is to em implement a global Marxist state. And they are incredibly well connected into the top levels of the new British government. But to start with, let's hear from George Bernard Shaw, who was one of the earliest members of the Fabian Society. I object to all punishment whatsoever. I don't want to punish anybody. But there are an extraordinary number of people whom I want to kill. Uh, not in any unkind or personal spirit, but it must be evident to all of you, you must all know half a dozen people at least, who are no use in this world, who are more trouble than they are worth. And uh, I think it would be a good thing to... Uh, make everybody come before a properly appointed board, just as he might come before the income tax commissioners, and say every five years or every seven years, just put him there and say, sir or madam, now will you be kind enough to justify your existence? If you can't justify your existence, if you're not pulling your weight in the social boat, if you're not producing as much as you consume, or perhaps a little more, then Clearly, uh, we cannot use the big organization of our society uh, for the purpose of keeping you alive because your life does not benefit us and it can't be a very much use. That's incredible. Yeah, isn't it just? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the sentiment at the heart of this movement, ultimately. Yes, so I thought we would just have a look at a couple of other uh, leaders of the, the or founders of the Fabian Societies. And the place to go to have a look at the full list is uh, the National Portrait Gallery. And they have uh, quite a number of people there, as you can see. But I, I just thought we'd talk, look at H.G. Wells. First of all, he was a founder of the Fabian Society, mostly known as a, uh, a science fiction writer, of course. Uh, the method that must come in, it must in some cases be called in, is death. The merciful obliteration of weak and silly and pointless things. This is very much expressing the same point of view that we've just heard on that video clip. Uh, and he went on to say, future humans will naturally regard the modest suicide of the incurably melancholy or diseased or helpless persons as a high and courageous act of duty rather than a crime. Uh, and just a reminder, if you read The Open Conspiracy, which is, well, it's supposedly not a science fiction novel anyway, he's talking about various things like ending the nation state, controlling human population, uh, that Russia is a crucial target for the inco for incorporation of the European system. Uh, so that's H.G. Wells. Let's look at somebody else here, Bertrand Russell. Uh, and uh, well, he's talking about propaganda mainly uh, and social psychology in this particular quote. But there, I mean, I could have chosen a, a host of different quotes from him. Uh, I think the subject which would be of most importance politically is mass psychology. Its importance has been enormously increased by the growth of modern methods of population of, of propaganda. Sorry, it may be hoped that in time anybody will be able to persuade anybody of anything. Uh, if he can catch the patient young uh, and is provided by the state with money and equipment. So, Ben, uh, that really sort of sums up the minds uh, that established this organisation in the first place. Absolutely, yeah. It's coercive control from top to bottom, isn't it? Um, well, look, we'll have a little look at some of the other pieces of the puzzle here. So, um, important, as we'll come back to, that the uh, mascot of the Fabian Society uh, was the tortoise. That was widely used until the 1960s. And their motto was, when I strike, I strike hard, which is a tribute to the Roman senator Quintus Fabius Maximus of Verucosus, uh, who built his reputation in conflict by avoiding direct confrontation 
in a war with Hannibal. So he would basically attack supply lines, avoid going after the main body of troops. But then when he did strike, he would strike hard and go very quickly and very forcefully towards the target. And I think that's what we're seeing right now. If you look at the way that the Starmer government has really come out of the gates over the past two weeks and just been implementing, implementing, implementing this nebulous change agenda that we don't really understand, I think that that's exactly what you're looking at here. Uh, we also know that they are um, uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. I mean, this is literally their, their sigils is how they present themselves. They don't uh, telegraph their intentions. This is very much in the Saul Alinsky school of thought. You don't tell people what you're actually up to. You make them think that you're benevolent and kind, but then you move quickly to implement your agenda once you've got into position of power, and they are in a position of power. So we've just had 141 MPs from the Fabian Society, elected into Parliament. right? They've been boasting about this on social media, and that includes, but not limited to, Angela Rayner, who's the Deputy Prime Minister, Rachel Reeves is the Chancellor, Yvette Cooper, who's the Home Secretary, Wes Streeting, who's the Secretary of Health and Social Care. Yeah, And I think if you remember the Blair segment from last week when he was talking about the need to force people to change if you love them, right, that's that. And very much that kind of mentality, right? That worldview. You have to justify your existence. We're going to force you to change. Like it's, it, that's right in the heart of the health system. Lisa and Andy at DCMS, who's going to be censoring everybody. And then, Ed, importantly, Ed Miliband, who I'll come back to in a minute, who's running energy security and net zero. And I think is actually on closer inspection, a total lunatic, right? If you really look at Ed Miliband, he's a very, very strange guy. Uh, who else in the Labour Party? So, um, uh, Gordon Brown, who's currently in the process of rewriting the British Constitution, he's a Fabian. But also, let's not forget the arch Fabian, Tony Blair, stood here in front of the Fabian uh, stained glass window saying, pray devoutly, hammer stoutly, which actually are quite good words to stand by, I think, but um, not in the context of what these people are trying to do. Uh, Blair's got an extraordinarily long history with the Fabian Society. Um, this was a... Uh, a uh, speech that he gave to an event uh, at the Old Vic Theatre in 2003, so midway through his own second term as Prime Minister. And he starts um, with a reference to the Clement Attlee government, um, uh, which was the Labour government of the Second World War. And he basically says that today we see that great 1945 government as coming closest to building a new Jerusalem. Yet immediately afterwards, it was routinely attacked on the left for not trying hard enough to form a socialist state as a bulwark against capitalism. That's right? how they understand the state. It's like a counterpoint to the markets. Yeah? And he basically says, um, and once more, now, midterm in our second term, talking about his own government, the same feeling is in the air again. Have we done enough? Are we radical enough? Right. So I think what we're seeing now with Blair running Starmer, essentially. He's pulling the strings behind the scenes. We've demonstrated that, I think, quite compellingly over the past several months in terms of what um, what Blair has been up to, what his institute has been up to. They're now driving a radical agenda, a radical neo-Marxist agenda, which ends up leading to places like this. Now, is this radical enough for you, Tony Blair? Right? This is the S21 torture chamber in Phnom Penh. This is the Khmer Rouge, who acted under the same ideological motivations that you're putting forward right what about this one holodomor three to six million people perished in ukraine because of stalin and his communist industrial policies and ideologies an attack on the industrial base the food supply and ultimately on the population itself this is not hyperbole right i believe that there is the distinct potential for an attack like that to be in the pipeline for us here in the UK. Why can I say that? Because people who are very close to the current Labour government are being extraordinarily critical and aggressive towards the farmers, for example. So this is from Dale Vince, who is a big-time uh, Labour donor and eco-millionaire. Right? He's one of these people that Brian talks about, that he's a rich guy, uh, but he wears t-shirts and jeans and you know talks with a with a slightly sort of working class accent and uses that as a way to disguise his his methods and his intentions and he's very much like a lot of people going after animal agriculture they want to transform uh, the food system they're demanding government intervention in absolutely every area of society there's Dale Vince himself uh, we can also see this in the food farming and countryside commission 
which is the organization linked into Paul Polman, who I spoke about uh, about a month or so ago. This is about delivering the SDGs. And you can see there, again, they are calling for the government to act on food. The government should have no role whatsoever to play in the food system. And yet people close to the current serving government are saying that this state needs to enter into the food supply. Absolutely madness. And it's not just food. It's also energy. Let's have a little listen to Ed Miliband. We're on a mission. It's going to be a great adventure. There are two parts to this mission. 2030 Clean Power, if you like the North Star for the department, and accelerating to, to net zero, because both of them are sort of absolutely crucial, and we've got a responsibility for both of them. One of the department's missions is to be bold on climate, on energy security, on jobs, on the cost of living crisis. You are my team, you are our team, and we need to be one team. I genuinely feel incredibly humbled uh, to be working with you. Thanks so much. Easy to lampoon Ed Miliband, uh, but I actually think he's an extraordinarily dangerous man and he has his hands around the energy supply and the transformation of the core infrastructure that runs the nation. And uh, what's his background? So we know that his father swore an oath at the graveside of Karl Marx to deliver the means of production back into the hands of the working people. Right. This is the lineage that we're talking about right at the top level of the Labour, Labour Party. And also, let's bring the tortoise back into things. I said that the tortoise was the was the mascot of the, the Fabian Society. And we've spoken a lot about tortoise media. Um, I believe that this is a direct reference to Fabianism. Uh, I believe that they are part of this communist takeover. It's run by this guy, James Harding, who's the editor in chief. And as we've spoken about earlier in the year, they work at Waddesdon House, which is owned by Yad Hanadiv, which is the Rothschild Foundation. Yad Hanadiv was there at the founding of Israel, built the Supreme Court and the Knesset. And actually, as it turns out, Lord Balfour himself of Balfour Declaration fame was a member of the Fabian Society. This is what is sitting at the heart of this new Labour government. Thank you, Ben. Thank you for that. Now, if you like what the UK Column does, you would like to support us, uh, the place to go is support.ukcolumn.org. Uh, a membership is a five hour a month. Uh, and if you can possibly do that, it helps us out massively. I want to say a massive thank you to everybody that has uh, supported us in this way. Uh, you, you could uh, help uh, subvert the algorithm by sharing our material uh, and so that we can deal with the censorship that we face on a daily basis. Uh, UKcolumn.org and UK column extracts of Coolidge UK are the places to go for that. Uh, and if you'd like to pick up something from the UK column shop, that would help massively as well. Uh, Debbie, uh, briefly, uh, your blog is not up yet, but it will be later on today. Blockbuster or a blockbuster. Um, I think it's going to be very interesting. We'll see something later on in the news that will link to it. But what is the Internet of medical, medical Things? Things cannot progress without it. And also an MHRA update and a few revelations that you might not be aware of. OK, thank you for that. And uh, uh, the interview that Brian did with Michael Nels is on the website now. If you didn't see that, it's there for you to watch. Please share that one as well. Uh, and Debbie, uh, John Bedoin. Yeah, John Bodwin, I have to tell Sorry. you that this is irrefutable <laughs> evidence on excess deaths and vaccine injuries. We have never seen anything like this before. This is bombshell stuff. If you haven't seen the interview, please do go watch. And there is a part two coming up soon. Thank you, Debbie. And uh, finally, uh, a reminder of the date for your diary, which is Saturday, the 19th of October, 2024, at a venue to be announced in, in Bristol. Uh, and uh, we will have more details of this next week. So please keep that in mind. Uh, so where does that take us? Uh, Debbie, uh, you were talking about water earlier on today. Uh, but and over the last number of weeks, you've been talking about desalination. So what's the latest on this? Well, yes, water all change. And again, sustainable, unsustainable, you choose. Do you know what is coming out of your tap? I have asked so many people that question and nobody as yet can give me an answer apart from people saying fluoride, uh, heavy metals, uh, lithium, uh, question mark. Um, so what is planned? What is in plain sight? And what is going on in our water industry? Because it is all change. And if you live near the coast, you'll be particularly interested in this. But already we know from the Financial Times that Labour are planning a new regulator.